So we know that Samson was a Nazarite, correct? We all know Samson's story, correct? If you don't, we will to give you a brief um, rundown of it. He was chosen to be a judge of Israel. Before there were kings, there were judges. So Samson was chosen to be a judge of Israel for 20 years. His parents were given the instruction to not cut his hair because he is a Nazarite. He was set holy. The one side note there is, if, an, if a Nazarite is set apart, holy for the Lord, guess if you are a believer, if you accepted Christ as your Lord, you too are separated as holy. Amen? This was our topic in, in, my Bible study, in our Bible study last Friday. But I see here, and we will see Samson's disobedience to God. Samson's disobedience to his parents and to God, which led to his demise. In Judges 14, 1 to 3, you'll see there that he intermarried with the Philistine woman and did not listen to the command and to his parents. The command that he's not supposed to be... Wait. Okay. What are we doing here? There. He's not supposed to intermarry. When anybody other than the Israelites. But he did it. And you see here, Samson went down to Timnah and saw that there, there a young Philistine woman where when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among your relatives or among all our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, get her for me. She's the right one for me. See, it, he basically said, I know better than you, Dad. Don't argue with me. You're old school, okay? You know what you're talking about. But the Bible already says they were told not to intermarry. It's just like, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 14, do not yoke with an unbeliever for us. It still applies to us. Us believers, we have different standards. Our standard is right here. This is our, these are our standards. It's totally separate. We're holy, separated from the world. But when we argue with our parents, when we don't obey, we suffer the consequences. That's one example. In Judges 14, 8, 9 and 15, 15, he touched dead animals and even ate the honey inside the lion. And then Judges 16, 17, 19, that will read. 16, 17 to 19, he says here, So he told her everything. Delilah kept asking him. For the life of me, I couldn't understand why he told her. For many years, every time I went through my reading with my everyday Jesus, every time I go through Samson, I have a big note there for myself. Why did he tell her? It was so obvious that she was trying to get him caught. Because not once but twice that he was tied up after waking up, after he told her what supposedly was the sign of his weakness. But he told her. He told her. So I was thinking, okay, why? So the first thought was, Maybe a nagging girl really can get anything she wants. <laughs> you know, that was my first thought. Okay, maybe she nagged him enough. They, all oh, right, you know what? Forget it. Just, all right, I'll tell you my secret. Maybe he truly loved Delilah, I was thinking. But as, but only last week, sadly, I'm so sorry. If you think I'm such a great learner of the, <laughs> student of the word, man, I just got this last Friday. What I saw there is, for many years, Samson has been disobedient. Samson has been disobedient. You see this chapter, one chapter at a time. But we don't know how many years apart this is. So he has disobeyed straight commands from the Bible, straight commands from his parents. He knowingly disobeyed Jesus, or disobeyed God and his parents. So he's been living a disobedient life. So what more? What happened to him? Why did he tell Delilah? His secret. You know why? Because he got so proud. He said, you know what? I can do all things. I'm Samson. I killed all these guys with a jawbone. He remembered.
prospers all his victories and he thinks he doesn't need God anymore because he knows too that he disobeyed God for many years. And he has disobeyed his parents for many years, but he's been okay. He's living an, an okay life. Nobody could stop him. What can Delilah do to him? So what more if he disobeyed this command? This is a command. My head hasn't been shaved. He says here, we're going to read it, 1790. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. And again, I'm telling you, I think he truly believed that this will not happen to him anymore because that's what sin does to us. One sin will lead to another sin and will lead to, lead to another sin, and the enemy will just let you think that you're not going to suffer any consequences. It's good. Life is good, Joe. Keep doing it. You're going to be okay. See, you're okay. It's been five weeks that you've been, <laughs> been going to church. It's been 10 months that you haven't been intimate with God. But you're okay. Got money in the bank. You're healthy. It's okay. You need to obey him. That's what happened to him. He said these things, but he didn't believe it. Because if he did, why would he tell him, her? When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines. Come back once more. He has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. Verse 19, having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll, see, look at this. This is his pride. Pride comes before destruction. Comes pride before destruction. If you think you know everything, if you think you're strong without God, if you think that you can live this Christian life with your secret sins and darling sins, and you think like this, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not. He did not know that the Lord had left him. Now for the believers here, we've good to say this, and I'm going to say it again. You don't lose your salvation. But that's not a license to sin. You lose your joy. You lose your blessings. You lose your effectiveness, your efficiency. You lose your usefulness for God. And once you do that, you will feel terrible, I'm telling you. It's like having the flu, only worse. And we know that's what happened to him. He did not get up. And then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes. <laughs> And took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They sent him to grinding in the prison, but the hair on his head began to grow. God's grace. You see God's grace? It's always there. God's grace is there. God's grace and mercy is new every morning, the Bible says. If you haven't been living this Christian life successfully, if you've been stumbling here and there, you have to know our God is merciful. Our God is gracious. His hair, his hair started growing. But that's an example. That's an example of a disobedient child. God had many plans for him. He judged Israel for 20 years. And we know how this ended, correct? He asked for forgiveness from God, and God gave him another chance. But as soon, but the, 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 the great thing with that story too is Samson killed more people of his enemy, killed more of his enemies during his death compared to when he was living. Because as Galatians 2.20 says, right? For it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live for him who loved me and gave himself for me. Once you take out your strength, and start thinking, stop thinking that it's you who's going to bring someone to Christ. You know what? Once you finally accept that fact that it's not me, it's going to be God through me, guess what's going to happen? 
better results. Better results. Once you stop thinking that it is you who's doing all these things for God, and once you just die to yourself, then greater things will be accomplished. If you've been trying, I mean, how else are we going to do it, right? Other than exerting effort when we're trying to repair relationships, our relationship with our parents, our relationship with our children, our relationship with our spouse. It does take effort on our part. It does. But the surrender and the surrender in our heart, it starts in our minds and our hearts where we say, it's not going to be me. It has to be God through me. Once we accept that, just like Samson. But then mind you, Samson asked for forgiveness and he repented. He stopped sinning. Well, of course, he's in shackles. He can't do anything stupid, right? Sometimes it takes for that for us to obey. Sometimes we need these hard things. For us to finally obey God, we need to be knocked outside, upside our head. We need to be kicked down on the floor, on the ground, dirty, just like the prodigal son, about to eat the pig's food before we completely make sense of it like, oh my gosh, I need God and I need to stop, stop living for myself, but stop living for Him. Sometimes, some of us, for most of us, sadly, it takes those things before we surrender to the truth. That's the example of a disobedient child through Samson. Now we're going to see an example of an obedient child in Timothy. Pastor Charles already gave us a, um, an opening here earlier. In 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul speaking, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. Now the word here, in you, in your, lived in your grandmother, the lived in is the same as dwelt. It's to dwell in. And then the word first is, the original language is protos, which is where we got prototype. The first. So parents, grandparents, the children needs to see it in you first, in us first. A lot of things are caught better than it's taught. Children always see it. They see the, the hypocrisy of what you're doing. If you're doing something else that's opposite of what you're trying to tell them, obey God, I tell you. I need you to obey God. Don't do what I do. Do what I say. Don't go out partying there. Don't go drinking. But mom and dad, you got your beer in the fridge. Don't do what I do. Do what I say. When you're finally out of my house, then you can do whatever you want, okay? But right now, you're going to do what I say. And don't for forget about what you see here. We don't say it that way. Maybe, maybe we do. I don't know. <laughs> maybe we do. But we have to live it. We have to live it. We have to show them. We have to exert it. But the sad thing is, even there are many times that even if there's a godly parent that's living everything according to what the Scripture says is truly and completely in love with God, sometimes, unfortunately, unfortunately, the children still choose to go make wrong decisions. But praise God, you're doing everything as God has told you to do. Amen. Because the number one person we need to please is God. Amen? He's the number one person that we need to please. But again, this is to show us here, he lived in, his grand, in Timothy's grandmother and his mother. And Timothy became the pastor of the church that made so much impact that up to now, everybody's experiencing. Timothy is an, ex is an example of an obedient child. We all want a Timothy as a child, for a child, right? Yeah, no? Okay, I do. We got Tim Tebow. <laughs> but here, this is, not, this is not, again, the result of an obedient child is not up to you, parents. Do we agree? It's not up to you. But you living it in your life, you showing it, that's up to you. 
if you're going to live a godly life, if you're going to do everything as the Bible says, if you're going to speak with love and full of grace to them, then they will see it. And they can't deny it. And once they make that wrong decision, they can't put the, point the finger at you. Because they know you were loud and clear with your words and with your lifestyle. Amen? Some of us are blessed to, have a fa- to come from a family with this. A godly grand- grandmother and a godly mother. Not all of us do. But here's a question. What do you want on your tombstone? We're basically talking about when you, when you go, right? What do you want? There's a, the, what's the last message you want to convey? Or what's the last thing you want people to remember you by? Is it this? Is this what you want in your tombstone? I told you I was sick. What legacy do you want to leave behind to your family? Is it, is it money? Is it just money? Yeah, there's nothing wrong. If, you, if, you're, if you're trying to prepare things for your family to be financially uh, stable, that's fine. But it shouldn't be just that, right? The legacy that, that the grandmother and mom of Timothy gave left a godly legacy. And here's one example of someone who left a godly legacy, and it's Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of 19 children. That's not a typo. That's 19, one nine. Including John and Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley wrote the hymns. John Wesley was the pastor. Through much adversity, she dedicated her life to instilling a sense of Christian destiny into each of her children. Her children went on to change the world. I pray that this is the kind of legacy, this is one of the legacies you want to leave with your family, or to people at least. She would, imagine 19 children. I have two children, and I have a wife who helps me, and it's still challenging. She has 19, and she still managed to leave a legacy of a godly legacy to her children. I want to read to you something here. Did you know that despite having 19 children, she still found time to pray? Women, mothers, parents. You need to find time to pray. You may have never heard of her, but you may have heard of her two sons, John and Charles Wesley. 